Good day, everyone, and welcome to the Human Heredity and Health in Africa or H3 Africa DNA Day webinar. Um, my name is Ebony Madden. I am um, a program director for the H3 Africa Ethical, Legal, and Societal Implications Program. And um, I would like to just welcome you to the H3 Africa DNA Day. Um, this is the second year um, that we are doing the um, H3 Africa DNA Day presentation. And this is the first of two presentations that will happen this year. The second pres presentation will be on Thursday, April 8th, which is about two weeks from today. DNA Day's official celebration date is April 25th, but the National Human Genome Research Institute celebrates it's every year from January through May. DNA Day is a global movement. It's to mobilize and energize and empower communities, educators and students to innovate, collaborate and discover the promise of our shared humanity and connection to the natural world. So now I am very proud to present our presenter, Catherine Skeepers. Um, Catherine Skeepers has a master's in science um, in human genetics from the University of Witwatersrand, South Africa, as well as a master's in philosophy and computational biology from Cambridge in the UK. She also has a PhD in virology from Witwatersrand in South Africa. Her current position is a senior medical scientist at the Center for HIV and um, STIs at the National Institute for Communicable Diseases and she has a joint appointment as the researcher for the Antibody Immunity Research Unit in the School of Pathology at the University of Bits. Dr. Skeepers is currently a co-investigator on a project within the um, Asia Africa Consortium that's focused on understanding antibody genetic diversity within South African populations and how that genetic diversity might impact antibody responses to HIV and other infections, such as sars cov COV-2 responsible for COVID-19. Her presentation that she's gonna to give today is titled, Do You Know You Have 10 Billion Different Antibodies in Your Body? Um, just a little bit of shopkeeping. Um, the chat has been disabled. So whenever Catherine concludes her presentation, Ali Osgood, a program analyst with the National Human Genome Research Institute, she's, she will moderate the Q&A. So please place all of your questions in the Q&A at the bottom of the screen. And I'll turn it over to Catherine. Thank you so much, Ebony. And again, um, thank you for this opportunity to, to give this talk. And um, yeah, thanks everyone for, for joining this um, DNA Day uh, event. So um, as Ebony said, I'm, I'm based at the National Institute for Communicable Diseases. We are based in Johannesburg in South Africa. Um, and I thought I'd just give you a little bit of background um, about the NICD before I started. So um, I'm based in a lab that is primarily focused on HIV vaccine discovery. But in the last year, we've been working on uh, coronavirus um, and vaccine um, research for, for COVID-19. So the NICD is really um, has been central to South Africa's COVID-19 um, response, understanding the number of cases that ha are happening in South Africa, looking at um, the different viruses that are circulating in South Africa and the efficacy of all the different vaccines against South African um, viral strains as well. So um, today I'm talking to you about antibodies, but it's gonna be in the context of um, viruses. So um, if I can, there we go. So viruses are these really tiny little um, bugs, if you can call them. So I thought I'd start by giving you an idea of how tiny these things are. So on this side of the scale on the spectrum here, a, an adult female is roughly around a meter in height. Um, and all of the things that you can see on this side of the scale are things that you can see with your naked eye, all the way down to the human egg. When you start getting into this middle range here, these are plant cells, animal cells, bacteria. These are things that you would have to see under a light microscope. Then a virus like the flu virus is on this side of the scale where you actually need something called an electron microscope to be able to see it in any sort of detail. 
So this is just to put into perspective how tiny these little things are that's causing such chaos in our lives right now. So there are many, many different types of viruses. And in fact, there's estimated 380 trillion viruses that are living in and around us at any given time. Now, most of the, these viruses are not harmful and they can be helpful, much like good bacteria. So I'm sure you've heard about probiotics and how um, having certain bacteria in your gut is actually quite useful. So viruses are the same. So this is just um, another picture of um, a number of viruses that actually can cause harm. So while there are good ones, there are also bad ones as well. And within viruses, you can see that there are also different sizes of viruses. So for example, variola virus that causes smallpox and Ebola virus are, are fairly large, um, right down to a parvovirus, which uh, causes disease in dogs. So um, this is what the rabies virus looks like and HIV is over here, this is the other virus that I study. This virus here is the SARS virus, and it's closely re related to the coronavirus that we're now dealing with that's causing COVID-19. So this is an electron microscope picture of what uh, SARS-CoV-2 is, which is the virus, the coronavirus that's causing COVID-19. So it has these little red blobs all over the virus, and that's what gives it the virus its name, the corona, because it looks like a crown. But it's not just pretty. These red blobs, we call them the spike protein. And this is how the virus actually attaches to our cells and gets in and infects you. So if we zoom in to this um, spike protein and you see this gr green arm that sticks out, this is how the virus actually attaches to our cells. It gains entry and then that's how you get um, infected. But as I said, this talk is not really about viruses, it's about antibodies. And so what have antibodies got to do with this? Well, antibodies are our natural defense force against SARS coronavirus. So antibodies stick onto the virus and then it prevents it from attaching to your cells and from getting in. In fact, antibodies protect us against many infections. So children are exposed to between 2,000 and 6,000 different antigens daily. Now an antigen is um, not, not necessarily something that is going to be harmful. It can be, it's anything that's foreign, but it can also be a bacteria, it can be a virus, it can be um, something that would give you an allergic reaction like pollen or a bee sting or nuts. And so antibodies, each of these antibodies are unique. So as I've shown them here inside this body is different colors represents them being different to each other. But in addition to them being unique, antibodies are also specific to particular antigens. So for example, this yellow antibody here would be specific to this yellow virus. So you can imagine if you have billions of different antibodies, it increases your chance of finding a match to any given antigen that you might be exposed to, whether it's bacteria or a virus or whatever it is. So antibodies just really form part of a bigger immune system. So your immune system is made up of an innate immune system and adaptive immune system. And I'm not gonna talk about this in detail, just to say that the innate immune system is made up of a bunch of different cells, like a natural killer cell that kills um, viruses and bacteria in different ways. So I'll talk about them a little bit more, a little bit later. But B cells are the ones that we really care about or that I'm gonna care about in this particular talk because B cells are the ones that make antibodies. And so in fact, you can get different types of B cells. So plasma cells are the ones that actually make the antibodies and release them into your bloodstream. And then you get memory cells. And these are the ones that once you have found a match to any given um, virus or bacteria, these memory cells then stick around, they hang around in your blood so that if you ever come into contact with that virus or bacteria again, you have some kind of protection. And so these memory B cells are really important for vaccine setting. So for a COVID-19 vaccine, the idea is that we take that SARS coronavirus spike, those little red blobs that I showed you, and we put them in a vaccine in such a way that is safe to patients so it doesn't uh, cause an infection um, and it's not harmful to the patients in any way, but it does prime the immune system to create a memory antibody response. 
to the virus. So this is really the basis of how most vaccines work. You find the part of the pathogen that binds to the human cell. You then you use that to prime your immune system to create a memory against that uh, virus or bacteria or whatever pathogen it is. So that if, you're, if you ever come into contact with the real thing, that you actually have some kind of protection. So antibodies are also important for other prevention methods as well as treatment. So if we use uh, COVID-19 again as an example, the idea is if you have a patient that um, had COVID-19 and then they recovered, we then take blood from that patient and we can isolate their antibodies or we can isolate their sera, which is just a part of your blood that actually contains all your antibodies. And then we can use that as a prophylaxis, which is just a fancy word for prevention. And um, the idea is you give it to people that are at high risk of that particular infection. So in the case of COVID-19, it's for healthcare workers. And so you would give them the antibodies so that should they ever come into contact with the coronavirus, they actually are protected because they already have antibodies. The other side then is to use them as a therapy for patients that have uh, coronavirus or are experiencing COVID-19 already. And the idea here is that the antibodies would then help fight the infection. So these kinds of approaches have been used for many diseases, including HIV and cancer. So what exactly is an antibody and how does it work? Well, an antibody is this Y-shaped protein that I'm showing you here. The black parts on top are what we call the antigen binding portion. So these are the arms really that grab out the, um, the pathogen or the virus and they attach onto the virus and block it from uh, attaching onto your cells. Then there's this part here that's called the FC portion and it's responsible for effector function, which just means different ways to kill the pathogen. So you can think of this part of the antibody as a general in the military. So he can either recruit the Air Force or he can recruit the Navy. It depends on what kind of um, pathogen or enemy he has and where they're based. And all of these cells down here, these are those innate immune cells that I was talking about earlier, and they can kill the virus in different ways. And so this general decides which of these cells he's going to recruit, depending on what kind of pathogen he wants and how he wants to kill. So how do we get so many different kinds of antibodies in our blood? Well, it's all in the genes. So these uh, antibodies, the dark, the black parts are called light chains and the gray parts are called heavy chains. And these two parts of the antibody are genetically different from each other. In fact, you need seven different kinds of genes to make a fully functional antibody. So in a light chain, you have a variable adjoining in a constant region gene. The heavy chains also have these types of genes, but they have an additional diversity gene. And so you need a combination of all of these genes to make your antibody. And so these genes are encoded on your DNA and your DNA is packaged very tightly into these little X um, things that we call chromosomes. And that's how you find them in the nucleus of your cell. So if you think of each of these chromosomes as a neighborhood, and the position in the chromosome as a physical location or a physical address where you would find a gene. So the heavy chain genes are found on the neighborhood of chromosome 14, and they're physically located right at the end of that chromosome. And if this wasn't all complicated enough, we have two different light chains and they're on two different neighborhoods. So the lambda light chains are found on chromosome 22 and kappa on chromosome two. And these light chains are found somewhere in the middle of each of these chromosomes. So if I zoom in to the heavy chain locus on, at the end of chromosome 14, I said that there are four different types of genes that make up these antibodies. Well, each of those types of genes have multiple versions. So for the V genes, you get upwards of 129 different V genes, uh, 27 D genes, nine J genes, and 11 constant region genes. So when you're making an antibody, what happens is that you get a single version of each of these genes come together for the heavy chain and they, for the light chain, and then they make the antigen binding portion. So you can think of this as like building with Lego blocks. So each of these different genes 
uh, represent a different either shape or color of a Lego block. And then you add them all together to create one single antigen binding site. So you can imagine all the different combinations of either colors or shapes of genes that you might have or Lego blocks that you might have that allows your immune system to create all these different versions of antigen binding site that allows you to respond to different bacteria or viruses. So the African continent is generally uh, poorly represented in genetic studies. So uh, as an example, so this is a little bit outdated now, this is based on 2016, and this is um, GWAS study, which is just a fancy word for a type of genetic study. So based on 35 million samples that were used for these types of studies, the black part here represents 81% so of those of European ancestry. Some of this small part of the pie represents um, the Asian population, and then this small part of the pie represents everyone else. So if we zoom on to everyone else, of those, only 3% of those samples represent uh, people of, uh, from the African population. So you can see not only is Africa underrepresented in genetic studies, but other populations as well. So because I'm based in Africa, we're trying to um, contribute towards a, a greater understanding of African genetics. And so um, I am based in South Africa. South Africa is right at the um, tip of the African continent. And we look at, um, we study uh, populations from KwaZulu-Natal, which is just a province on the east coast of South Africa. And we look at two different locations. So Durban is right along uh, the coastline um, of KwaZulu-Natal, and then Vulunglela is a rural area further inland. And so we ask the question, do South Africans have unique antibody genes? And so to understand this, we take blood from people from those different locations that I just described, then extract their DNA, and we zoom in to the heavy chain um, antibody genes. And so if I zoom in again, this is work done by one of our master's students, Elaine Marsden. And I'm going to just focus on a small portion of the different versions of V genes that you get. So this um, little block here represents uh, the sequencing that we did for one person called CAP88. Each of these um, columns or blocks on the top here with numbers represent different genes and the numbers are the gene names. Now everybody has two copies of every chromosome, one that you get from your dad and one that you get from your mom. So each row here represents your different, the different chromosomes. So the block, if it's gray, it means that this person has that gene. If it's white, it means that they don't have that gene. So you can see that this person cap 88 has two copies of the gene 333, but no copies of the gene 433. And if you compare across the chromosomes, you can see that some cases you would have the gene on one chromosome, but not the other. So this means that between your chromosomes, you can have very different antibody genes. And then if you compare a different person that we studied, CAP255, you can see that she doesn't have any of these genes here, but, um, and then CAP88 does. So not only can your genes differ between your chromosomes, they can differ between people. Now, this is not something that is specific to South Africans. We've seen this in other populations as well. And this is work done by a collaborator of ours, Dr. Corey Watson, and he is based at the University of Louisville in the US. But now if we zoom into each of these genes and each of these colors represents different version of those genes, you can see that you can also get very different versions and this can differ between chromosomes and between people. So the red colors here represent completely new versions or versions that have not been described before um, until the South African population that we've had a look at. In fact, out of all the, the versions of these antibody genes that we've looked at in South Africa, almost half of them have not been described before. So this means that people can make very different antibody responses. But while people make very different antibody responses, we also see that people can make very similar or the same response against the same uh, virus or bacteria. 
And this is really important uh, when it comes to vaccine design. So in a case like COVID-19, where we're trying to test uh, the same or very similar vaccines in a global setting, you want to know that that vaccine is actually going to be protected in the global setting. So up until now, I've been talking about changes in the binding part, so the part that grabs onto your antibody, I mean, sorry, onto the virus, but that's not the only part of an antibody that can change. So you can also change the effector end of the antibody. So this is the general in the military. You can also change up your generals. So these are all the different types of generals that we get in antibodies. And so we call them isotypes, they're called antibody isotypes. So IgM and IgG antibodies are the first antibody response that you get um, against any uh, pathogen. IgE antibodies respond to allergens. So um, those are the ones that give you an allergic reaction to either bee stings or pollen or nuts, for example. IgGs are the most abundant antibody that you find in your bloodstream, and they're really important for viral infections. IgA are also important for viral infections, but they're interesting in that you can find them either as a single version or as a double version stuck together. In the single version, you find them in the blood. In a double version, you find them in the mucosa, which is just a fancy word for, say, um, where you have mucus, so in your nose, your mouth, and in your gut, for example. So you can switch out your antibodies um, through a process called class switch recombination. So we spoke about this VDJ. This is the Lego block of the antibody binding site. And so your IgM antibodies are the first that get made because they're the closest one to this Lego block. So when your antibody comes in contact with a virus, what happens is that you get uh, chemicals getting released. They're called cytokines. This is your general that then shouts to say, um, actually, we need something more specific. And in this case, it might be an IgG1. You get an enzyme that then helps, it's called AID. It helps bring IgG1 closer to the Lego block. And then, it, so these uh, little ovals here with the lines, they're called switch signals. So you go from an IgM switch to an IgG1 switch. Anything in between that gets cut out and you make an IgG1 antibody. So the important part here is that the Lego block stays the same. So you're still hanging on to that same virus. You're just making a more a specific antibody response. So we're also interested in, as to whether um, we see genetic differences in these different generals as well. And this is work done by um, some other master students of ours, Ty and Holly. So IgG antibodies are fairly well uh, described. So we know a lot about them and we've seen lots of versions of them. So for IgG1, we've seen 14 different versions. And for IgG3, we've seen 29 different versions. But despite them being well described, we've, described, we've seen another two versions in um, IgG1 in South African population and another five um, IgG3s. So IgA antibodies are not as well uh, described in general. And so we don't know as much about them. So we've only seen three versions of either IgA1 or IgA2. So within our South African population, we've seen another eight versions of IgA1 and five versions of IgA2. So what does this all mean? Well, remember I said that this uh, part of the antibody is the general that recruits the different uh, parts of the military. So IgG3 antibodies are a particularly powerful general. They uh, can recruit a lot of cells and they um, are very effective at mediating different functions. So what we try and understand then is what do these different versions of these uh, antibodies, how does it change their function? And this is work done by a postdoc in our lab, uh, Simone Richardson. So what we do is we take an antibody, we keep the same antigen binding site, but then we make that um, as an IgG1 version and the different IgG3 versions that we've discovered. So we test uh, the ability of these antibodies to recruit natural killer cells and to mediate cellular lysis. So this graph shows um, the ability of these antibodies to mediate the cellular lysis. So the higher the bars, 
the better they are at doing this. So this antibody um, is the same whether it's an IgG1 or these two versions of IgG3 at mediating this uh, cellular lysis, but it, this version of IgG3 is worse. We tested against phagocytosis, and in this case, the IgG3 versions are much better than IgG1. And then when we compare trogocytosis, which is just the way uh, nibbling um, away different cell membranes, you see that this version of IgG3 is much better than the others. So you can see that um, it's not a one size fits all situation. Some generals are better at mediating certain functions than others, um, but it is helpful when it comes to um, understanding antibody responses. So what does this mean in general? So I spoke about antibodies being used as therapeutics or in prevention. So we take antibodies and you can give them either as an IV or you can give them as an injection. If we know that that antibody is really potent or really good um, at responding to a virus, let's say coronavirus. So we take this antibody, we know that it's uh, fairly good at um, responding to coronavirus, but if we know that there are changes somewhere in this top part here that would make it better, we can actually engineer antibodies. So we make those changes in the antibody before we use it as a therapeutic or a preventive. And then we create a much more potent uh, or much stronger response. Um, but what we can also do is engineer the bottom part of the antibody. So instead of being a lone soldier trying to fight off this virus, we can change this bottom part to recruit far more military and be a lot more effective. So not only can we make it a stronger response, we can make it a, a, a broader response that's much more effective against any given pathogen. So going back to the coronavirus, so like antibodies, viruses can also change to avoid detection by the immune system. And we've seen this happen now with, with COVID. So if this pink virus here represents the first virus, the first uh, version of the SARS-CoV-2 that was described in China, it has now um, mutated across the world and we're seeing different versions of the virus. So what this means is that, the, so the, all the vaccines that we have currently, the Oxford, AstraZeneca, the Pfizer, the Moderna, Johnson & Johnson and Novavax vaccines are all based on this first version of the virus. That means we have really strong antibody responses. So when they were talking about efficacy, everything was 90% effective against the virus. And that was true for 90% efficacy against this first strain, really strong antibody responses. And we were all really excited. And then the virus mutated and now the <laughs> responses are not as good. The good news is we can, and most of these vaccines are being modified to look more like uh, the newer versions of the virus. And we have already seen that um, antibodies against the later versions of the virus can then be really strong. So this is something that the field is generally working on. So I hope that I've now convinced you that antibodies are really important, that antibody genes are highly diverse and that our genes that make antibodies can be very different between individuals. So it's really important to understand antibody genetics on a global uh, scale. So it's, it's not um, helpful if you're trying to look at uh, a pandemic response if you only know what antibody responses are for a tiny proportion of the population. So it's really important to study antibody genetics in all populations. And understanding these genetic differences can help us improve uh, antibodies either for prevention and treatment against diseases. So I just also want to acknowledge that I'm part of a really big lab and actually this photo is outdated, we're much bigger now. Um, but this is a, a really big um, collaborative response between our lab um, that makes all of this work possible. I want to particularly shout out to um, all of the master's students um, and uh, postdocs that have been involved in this work as well as obviously Lynn um, Morris and Penny Moore that head up uh, our lab. Also collaborators at the Watson Laboratory at the University of uh, Louisville. I also particularly want to acknowledge Caprisa. They are um, 
the, the group that coordinates all the different participants that are, are willing and prepared and do give us samples for us to examine. And then, of course, our various funders that also make all of this work possible and, um, and of course, H3 Africa that uh, helps us uh, coordinate all of this work as well. And with that, I will stop sharing and then I'll hand over to you, Ali. Thank you, Catherine, for that informative um, presentation. Uh, and thank you for sharing your time and expertise with us today. Uh, so it seems like we have some questions coming in. The first one, someone asked, how does this preventative method for COVID-19 compare to PrEP? Uh, and they asked this earlier on in the presentation. Okay, so um, I'm going to assume that um, PrEP by PrEP, they mean um, either tenofovir um, being used in uh, for prevention for HIV or the use of antibodies um, against HIV. So um, PrEP uh, in the sense um, of tenofovir is what, so what happens is that we're using a drug that we use to um, treat people for HIV. We give it to them before they become infected with HIV and it actually prevents them from getting infected. So the idea there is to use a drug um, for prevention rather than treatment. Um, we've also now finished uh, the AMP study. And what um, this was is a broadly, what we call in the HIV field is a broadly neutralizing antibody. What that means is it's just an antibody that's really, really good. It's like a Superman antibody against multiple strains of HIV. And we showed that if you give that antibody to somebody before they become infected uh, with HIV, you can actually prevent um, HIV infection. And so this was the first proof of concept that we can actually use antibodies to prevent infection uh, against viral infections, particularly in HIV. So the idea is the same here in terms of COVID, where you're using an antibody um, as a prevention to um, a coronavirus infection. So um, again, we're looking at, uh, so right now we're looking at antibodies that were potent against the first strain of the virus, but um, we're starting to see that people that were infected with newer strains of uh, the coronavirus actually have a much better antibody response. And they seem to have kind of a broad response against the newer variants and earlier variants of coronavirus. Um, and so it's potential that we could then use those antibodies that are really potent um, and use them in prevention. And this is not going to be something that would um, be used instead of a vaccine. It's kind of a placeholder until we can vaccinate everyone. So you're using very quickly an antibody, uh, get that out to people before we can actually get people to make their own immune responses through a vaccine. So it's a very similar kind of uh, idea. Thank you. Um, and another question, actually these two questions sort of go together. Um, what tools are proving most useful in expanding our understanding of antibodies? And sort of along with that, what are some of the innovations that you've seen due to the discovery of COVID-19? Okay, so um, tools, I, I, I'm assuming they're meaning um, experimental tools. So, um, I mean, the field has moved incredibly um, quickly in response to COVID-19. So the idea of now having a vaccine 18 months later was almost unheard of before um, COVID-19. So it's, it used to take us years to get um, a vaccine that would be rolled out or even into a phase three trial. So, um, so some of the tools I would say in terms of um, not necessarily laboratory tools, but one of the things that has really been incredibly instrumental is how we think about vaccine design. So what happened before is um, you would uh, take an, an idea um, of a vaccine, you would test it in the lab, see that it's actually generating some kind of uh, response that you expect it to. You do some animal models and then you start doing uh, phased efficacy trials and safety trials. 
Now, what we've done um, with COVID is we've piggybacked on technology that we've used for HIV and we've used for other uh, viruses like um, Ebola and Zika virus. We just modify those vaccines to be specific for coronavirus rather than Zika or Ebola. And then we use that technology. So we're not starting from scratch. So adopting technology that we've used for other viruses, um, but apply it to coronavirus. And then we've applied a strategic model of doing parallel um, safety and efficacy trials. So while there would be a pause between a phase one and a phase two trial, we don't pause, we just go straight into the next trial. That's allowed us to fast track things. Um, so that's in terms of vaccine design. Other things in terms of um, technologies is sequencing technology has also improved massively. So where before we would do um, something called Sanger sequencing that it would allow you to sequence um, a single gene for one person, um, we can now do a single gene for multiple, or we can do multiple genes for multiple people on one sequencer very quickly. So these are just um, sequencing technologies that we call um, next generation sequencing. That's helped us improve our, our understanding of antibody genetics massively. Um, so sequencing technologies, other technologies that uh, allow you to sort your cells. So um, yeah, the, the technology is has been um, massive progress, I would say, to help us understand um, antibody genes in general and antibody responses to different pathogens. I hope that answered the, the question. Thanks. Um, and another question, someone asked, how do you engineer antibodies in the lab? So that's a good question. So um, what we do, uh, so there, there are different ways that you, we make antibodies. Um, so you essentially, you take a sequence of the antibody. And if we have, um, so we know what the sequence is. So let's say we have uh, the baby Superman version of an antibody. Okay, we know what that sequence looks like. Then we see in our uh, genetic studies that there are some mutations that makes um, this antibody actually attach either better to um, the virus or there's a mutation in the general part of the antibody that allows it to recruit better cells. What we do is we make those uh, changes in the sequences and then um, you use a, a, a method that's called cloning I know that's going to sound really scary because when people say cloning, you think about cloning um, a sheep or cloning a person. <laughs> We're not talking about macro cloning. We're talking about cloning in a very small cellular scale. Um, and that allows you to just, we take bacteria and we get the bacteria to kind of make the antibodies for us. So you just, um, you change the, anti the sequence of the antibody and then you just clone it out and get that um, get the bacteria to kind of make the antibody for you. That's a, a very uh, crude explanation of it. That's a helpful explanation too. <laughs> um, someone asked, what types of mutations can weaken a virus? So there are mutations. Um, so when we talk about uh, mutations, the virus can mutate and an antibody can mutate. So we're seeing now um, mutations that are happening in coronavirus. So we call this a co-evolution. Um, we study it quite a lot in HIV because HIV is a chronic um, viral infection. But it, we see it now also in a way with uh, coronavirus. So what happens is when you create an antibody response, you, um, your antibodies are then attaching to the virus, um, but your virus, the virus also wants to get away from that response. So it can also change its uh, DNA to get away from those responses. So we see some changes now in the spike. I showed um, those red blobs of the spike protein. So we see now coronavirus can actually make changes in that spike protein 
that now, so the antibodies that we did have against the virus actually can't attach anymore. They can't block infection anymore. So that's one way how a virus can get away from um, antibodies. But then of course, our immune system doesn't just sit and wait uh, or just get infected. Um, we continue to fight. And so our antibodies then make uh, mutations in their binding site that allows it to still attach or to attach again to the new version of the virus. And this is how we call evolve in a way with the virus. So the virus changes and the antibody responds. The virus responds by changing an antibody response. So how th this goes. Um, sometimes though, viruses make mutations. So viruses mutate all the time. Um, and sometimes those mutations mean that uh, the virus is not as effective anymore at infecting cells, but that would be short lived and the virus, um, you know, that version of a virus wouldn't stick around. So generally the viruses that are predominating would have some kind of immune um, uh, effect or would be have a benefit for it. So either it infects better or it can uh, escape from antibody responses better. Um, and someone asked, or they said earlier in your presentation, you mentioned memory cells. Do those live or are they around forever in the human body for someone's entire lifetime? So that is a, is a very good question. Um, so your memory response does change depending on what you get exposed to. So, um, memory cells that you had earlier on in your life wouldn't necessarily, the exact amount of time that it would stay in your system, that I do not know, but um, probably somebody does know that on, an answer to that. But um, your memory response can change. So your, the, the memory cells that you have in your system can change depending on what you've been exposed to. Um, so I, you know, if you got uh, the flu last week, or a couple of months ago, a particular type of flu, or let's say you came across a, a completely strange type of bacteria, you might have a memory response to that now that you didn't have before. So your memory does change, um, but how long the, those cells stick around for, that's a good question and I shall go look at it. Um, and someone asked, also asked what genomic sequencing technologies are being used to detect the genetic variants associated with antibodies. So do they mean viral variants or antibody? So I'll, I'll talk about both. So, um, okay, so the sequencing technologies that we're using to understand um, the viral variants, so there are multiple technologies. The one is an Illumina MySeq. So I spoke about next generation sequencing. So this is a sequencing platform that allows you to sequence um, lots and lots of reads of multiple samples at the same time. Um, so we predominantly use Illumina NextSeq. Um, it's a really high throughput sequencing platform um, that gives you a lot of depth. And so um, another technology that we use is an ion torrent. Um, it's also a next generation sequencing. Um, a Genexus is the type, so like a NextSeq for Illumina, Genexus is a type of ion torrent. Um, that's also really good for um, sequencing viral variants. It's really quick um, and um, it gets really good coverage as well of the, of the virus. In terms of antibody sequencing, we try different approaches for this. So you can do an amplicon sequencing approach, which means that you just design primers to amplify just one gene. And then that kind, those kinds of amplicons for multiple people, we can put on Illumina MySeq. So um, an Illumina MySeq is a short read technology that only gives you a maximum 600 base pairs um, through a paired end uh, sequencing. So we can do an amplicon approach on a MySeq. We also do a full length um, sequencing either of an amplicon of constant region genes. You can do that on a PacBio. It's also a next generation sequencer, but it, it allows you to do really, really long reads. So most next generation sequencer is short read. Um, PacBio is long read and we use that for um, 
long amplicon sequences, so for constant region genes. We also do, in collaboration with Corey Watson's lab, we do um, IGH um, capture. So when I showed the different chromosome 14, he um, then basically captures that whole region of chromosome 14 for the entire heavy chain. So all of those different V genes, D genes, J genes, um, we sequence that on one capture um, on PacBio. So again, utilizing the long... Sorry about that. That's a, <laughs> it's an alarm telling me I need to go fetch my children. Um, <laughs> sorry. So um, yeah, so the, it also utilizes the PacBio long read um, sequencing that we do um, for IGH capture. And um, I think those are the main technologies that we use. So it's Illumina, MySeq, NextSeq, and PacBio sequencing for viruses and antibodies. Thank you. Um, another question someone asked, how representative is the IMGT database, which is a reference database, for African populations considering the high genetic diversity um, in these populations and on the continent? So the good news is that um, most of the sequ sequences that we have generated from South Africans is currently in IMGT. The bad news is that in general, um, IMGT and any other antibody uh, reference database is really lacking, not just for African um, sequences, but any population other than European or ca Caucasian individuals. So this is something that we're trying to address on a global scale. Um, so it's not just Africa, you can think about um, Latin America is poorly underrepresented as well on IMGT, but on any um, antibody genomics reference database and any genomics database in general. So this is something that um, the scientific community as a whole needs, needs to address. Yeah, and going off of that, um, thinking broadly, how could researchers build trust with communities in order to increase representation in studies like these? So this is one of the things that H3Africa is really um, great uh, with and something that they have been um, working on. So it's really the idea of community engagement. So the last thing you want to do is just have a bunch of scientists going, I have this great idea. Why don't you give me some of your blood and I'm going to test these things. And then, you know, the person knows, has no idea as to why you're doing these things. Um, and you know, never hears from you again. So what we want is really to engage in the community and um, allow them you know, to understand what it is that we're trying to do, get them on board with the research. It's really, really important to have um, in any kind of research, um, scientific in or uh, clinical trial research is to have a community engagement. You want the people that um, you're trying to do research with to be part of the process um, and only by making them part of the process does it all work you know for everyone's benefit we can't have um you know scientists sitting in in their labs going let's just take blood from people and um, and the people don't know why we're doing things so community engagement is really really important in h3 africa is that's one of the main components of what they do thank you uh, it seems like Switching directions a little bit, uh, someone going back to tools, um, they were curious what data science tools your lab is using to analyze the genetic data that is collected. Okay, so um, again, I'm gonna talk about this in terms of antibody repertoires as well as uh, viral sequencing. So um, because I have a background in, in bioinformatics or computational biology, um, it's okay for me to do command line um, analysis, but there are a lot of people that want to be able to analyze their own data that can't um, or don't have the understanding of doing command line. And so one of the tools that we use is um, Galaxy. And so um, there is a... Um, it's called usegalaxy.org, but there's various um, versions of Galaxy. Um, that's an online web-based tool. And you don't need to be a, a bioinformatician to be able to use this. You basically log into a website 
and um, there are various tools that you can use, workflow. So I use this a lot for um, COVID viral sequencing analysis. Um, there's a COVID-19 uh, vaccine, or uh, sorry, a COVID-19 project, a, ga a Galaxy project. And what happens is that you have bioinformaticians in the background developing these tools, and then they make it available on the Galaxy website so that anybody can then, it is literally, you just click a button that um, you press play and it analyzes all the things for you. So you have a team of computational biologists in the background that generate these tools and you can then analyze your data. So Galaxy is really powerful in that regard for people that don't have computational biology um, background. In terms of um, antibody um, genetics, so we, we do a combination of in-house um, uh, analysis tools. So when it's expressed antibody repertoires, we use things um, like incantation uh, pipelines, we use sonar pipelines. So these are all um, freely available pipelines that uh, you can find on GitHub. Um, and they're all command line based um, tools. There are other things uh, like Tigger and Partis, um, and these are tools that take expressed antibody repertoires and then predict what your germline would be. For um, germline antibody sequencing, again, we do command line tools and we have a combination of in-house pipelines that we've written up in R and in, um, but we use things like FastX uh, toolkit SAM tools. These are all free tools that are available on GitHub um, so if you're comfortable with command line, then GitHub is the place that you want to be looking at for these kinds of tools. If you're not comfortable with command line, there are loads of things available on Galaxy. Anybody can register for usegalaxy.org um, and you can use the tools there. And you can also just um, shout out or you know connect with uh, some of the developers on Galaxy or on GitHub. Um, and they can also direct you to you know, the right analysis tool. So, in short, I guess we use a combination of um, freely available and in-house things that we write up ourselves. Thank you. Um, another question someone had was, how did you identify the new antibody alleles, um, de novo assembly, considering that these new sequences are not in the IMGT database? Great, <laughs> good, good question. So um, what we do right now is that you use a, um, a database of sequences that we know um, are there. So, so we pull down all the sequences that are available on IMGT. We pull down sequences that are available also on IGPDB. So IGPDB, for those that don't know, it's an immunoglobulin polymorphism database. And um, you will find sequences in there um, that are not sometimes not on IMGT for various reasons that they might be short um, or they come from an expressed antibody repertoire, or whatever. And we pull down all the sequences that we can get hold of. We then use um, a customized version of BLAST and we BLAST our sequences against those. So we just look to see um, what is the closest relationship that we can find to any of the known sequences. Sometimes you get a 100% hit, so the sequences that you see are already described. Sometimes you don't, and it would be a single nucleotide or um, you know, a few nucleotide differences. And then we, we then call that, um, within a certain percentage of identity, you call it a new um, allele. However, there is, using that approach, when you just do um, a single amplicon, you can't determine what whether something is just a new version of a gene or if it's a new gene. So this is where sequencing the whole chromosome is really powerful. So you can actually locate the position of the different genes um, on the chromosome. And you can see then if you are dealing with an entirely new gene versus um, a new allele. But then again, this you have the same problem. What are you comparing it to? So what we do for the capture is, again, we pull down as much information as we can from all the sequences that we do have. We create um, kind of a mixed, uh, a customized reference. So it's mixed up of different uh, sequences that we have. And we do our best guess of what we can, you know, assembly or assemble um, based on what we already know. 
Um, but the more sequences we get from more populations, the better our reference is going to be. So this is why it's really important. Um, and also it's, it's important to understand what your own germline reference would be, because when you're looking at your expressed antibody repertoire, so that's after you've put all the Lego blocks together, and if you sequence that, if you're going to try and figure out what is what is those individual blocks look like, you need to have a really good reference for that as well. So it's really important to sequence as many people as we can to get a better idea of what the reference is going to be so that we can know which genes are really important for a particular response to a particular virus or bacteria or whatever it is. Interesting, thank you. And I think we have time for about two more questions. Uh, someone asked, does CRISPR have a role in your research? They do. So we work with CRISPR. Um, uh, so, so I guess, let me take a step back. So there is CRISP and then there's CRISPR. Are they talking about CRISPR in terms of the um, experimental, uh, do you have the, the, the spelling of CRISPR? So in terms of like cutting things out and changing up the genes using a CRISPR-Cas technology. Is that what they mean for CRISPR? That's what I assume they mean. Okay, so that's what they mean. Okay, so we don't use CRISPR um, for that um, in, in our way of um, changing up antibody genes or, um, or changing up viruses. We use something that's um, similar, but it's not the same technology that we use for that, no. All right, and then someone just do you have any advice um, or for people who want to be scientists? Um, and from your perspective, where do you see opportunities um, in this field? So um, I guess this is a general um, audience that we're talking to. So I would say to students that are interested in, um, in being scientists, if you, um, this is going to be, you know, like the typical um, stay in school, don't do drugs. Um, but, but you, you know, if you want to be um, a scientist and you're interested in this, is continue um, to pursue your, your studies in school. So I should say, that I first um, discovered genetics in grade eight. Um, and uh, since then, um, I also had a really fantastic uh, biology teacher at the time that presented genetics to me. And from that, that get-go, I decided I want to be um, a doctor in genetics. And so here we are. I don't want to say how many years later, but um, uh, this is what I'm doing. So if you have, you know, um, if you have this desire to pursue this, it's just to keep going. It's a long haul. There's a lot of studying that goes involved. But if this is something that you're passionate about, then, um, you know, reach out to people. Um, you know, people are, you know, welcome to reach out to me um, if this, this is something that you're interested in doing. So find um, labs, find people in uh, areas that you are in that are doing these things and start shadowing those people, start asking them questions, um, find out, you know, who's doing what. Um, COVID, you know, is, is a great um, way to kind of get involved in science. Everybody around the world is, is involved in this and trying to understand this. So if you're interested in science, figure out who are the people that are responding to COVID and see if there's something that you could do. It could be anything on any level, um, even as a student, you know, um, in school or in university. Um, so it would be, for me, it, if you have a desire to do that, keep pursuing that and find out who the key people in your area are and align yourself with that. So one of the main I think things for me that has been um, has contributed to my career thus far has been aligning myself um, working with uh, Lynn Morris and Penny Moore. So when I I was in the UK first working there and wanted to come back to South Africa to do um, a PhD, I found out that Lynn was working on HIV, doing amazing work, and so I just emailed her to say, "Hey, I am interested in doing a PhD. Would you take me?" 
Um, so it's about finding key people that um, you know are doing amazing research and finding out if they are willing to work with you, um, aligning yourself with with um, with collaborators that do great science. So as a scientist, you need to understand that it's not going to be about you. It's a team effort. So um, you need to be prepared to collaborate with people, but you also need to figure out who the right people are, um, get the right mentors to start off with. And then um, those mentors will then introduce you to, to great collaborators. But those are the main things. Continue to focus on your passion, but also understand that you're going to need keep key players in this. It's not about you, it's about a team. Well, thank yep. you so much. And thank you for joining us today and for celebrating the DNA Day season. Um, mm -hmm. And thank you to everyone who attended. Um, the next H3 Africa DNA Day event is on Thursday, April 8th. Uh, and have a great rest of your day or evening, depending on where in the world you are.